Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking about the absolutely incredible film Tar. We are joined today by writer and director Todd Field, production designer Marco Bitmer Rosser, set decorator Ernestine Hipper, and costume designer Bina Deigler. And Todd, I wanted to start by by just talking about how you initially envisioned the way that you were visually going to tell this story, because there's obviously a lot of large visual choices in the film, but there's also incredibly specific detail throughout, you know, even down to the fact that you had a photographer go to the Amazon to shoot a shaman to then Photoshop in a picture with Kate that's in the background of one of the sets. And so as you were writing the script and developing the story, I was interested in how you started to come up with not only the the larger aesthetic of how you saw yourself telling this film, but the spaces where you started to feel like it was going to be such a necessity to be that minute with so many of the details that we end up seeing on screen. Well, you know, it's one thing to sit at your table and write these things and to dream these things up. And it's quite another um, uh, for those dreams to become a reality or or to, you know, to become something beyond what you dreamed up. Um, and the things that you point out having to do with, um, in this case, a, a piece of a key piece of art direction, um, there was there was a lot of hands in that you know um there were uh nigel wool our our line producer's hands in terms of um tracking down that photographer that we had referenced down in the amazon and, and figuring out a way to get in touch with him there was marco's hands in terms of coordinating with a facilitator um to do that i mean there was um uh, a full photo shoot that had to be lined up on the other side um, with very, very technical things having to do with, you know, uh, the f-stop, the, the distance from, et cetera, et cetera. There was the way that she would be dressed by Bina. There was uh, key props by Ernestine. So um, there were just an enormous amount of um, talent and effort and um, vision to just for that one key piece of art direction amongst hundreds of things that that the um that the people that I just mentioned created for this film. And for me, it was a simple thing. I, I wrote it in the script, you know. So um that's a that's a very good example. Um and, and there are many others of things that um the level of commitment uh to execution and detail in the in the most magnificent manner um was not something I would have ever imagined um I would have this was a a very very special um group of filmmakers you know um that I was allowed to collaborate with and um and and they never rolled their eyes at me and I really am grateful wow. for them <laughs> I love that and and Marco and Ernestine I wanted to start by talking about the the dynamic and the visual aesthetic of Tara's apartment because it's such a crucial location and design within the film because it's such a character study piece of her throughout. Um, and there's different aspects in terms of the different spaces, even within the apartment, you know, her her kid's room feels very different to the office space where she works, to the living room. You know, there's a lot of kind of gray muted tones, but at the same time, there's these little pops of color, like red carpeting or the color of the cushions that are seated on the sofa. And then even just when you look at the artwork, that's such a representation of her aesthetic and her cultural taste, um, you know, and, and the, the light in it feels feels very stark during the day and quite warm at night. And so I was really interested in how you came up with, with all of these different elements that you wanted to marry together into not just reflecting a singular viewpoint of her as a character, but all these different sides and aspects of her. Well, okay. the, the, the first um, thing was to, to kind of define the location or the, like the space that we wanted to uh, set her in. And that was a, um, like a long development that um, Todd and I were discussing the space, uh, how the space should actually feel like that she lives in because it's such a character defining space for the film and de um, defining the relationship between her and Sharon and, and there's so much happening in there. Like we spent nine shooting days in, in that space. So um, that was a thing and we, we didn't take it like we looked at a lot of spaces and um, finally walked into one that just felt that it had the right kind of level of in one 
um, like it's kind of a brutalist architecture that um, almost feels like it's troll at the same time as being a li living space. So it's got this, um, uh, the two sides uh, being a lived in space, but at the same time feels quite austere. And that's just from the layout of the architecture. And <clears throat> then in terms of um, colors and textures, like the concrete of um, of the space gave us in some, like concrete is a really um, like very flexible material of what it does when you change the lighting. So, and when you add colors to it, so it's got a, it's, it's a warm gray, but as soon as you do the lighting, it becomes, it gets like a, a warm amber tone. And that really helped to um, create the different atmospheres that um, the scenes required um, within that one architectural space. And for you, Ernestine, what, what were kind of the key components uh, of that coming together from a lot of the set decoration that you ended up building with your team? Um, well, as soon as we walked into Boris' apartment, we all went like, whoa, this is actually the space which gives, you know, Todd's visions the room and and everybody the, the chance to to turn to provide what the characters needed because Sharon was... It was actually, they bought it together or whatever you have to implement. There had to be a child living in there. So we had to find a way to marry them, the code architecture, and still make cozy areas. So it's a believable surroundings for, for, a, for a girl. And in colors, we try to just melt in and so we don't distract uh, the actors too much, you know. And, you know, that was a, a great challenge. It was a fabulous place. I mean, we had to, it was an art, um, an art collector's home. So of course we had to take all the colorful bits and pieces out and strip it down to the needs and until it had the classy feel what it needed. But it was really, it's really turned out beautiful, especially with all the lighting at night and during the day. It was a, a great, great um, location. I love that. And, and Bina, in talking about the, the costumes for Lydia in the film, um, you know, it, it sounds like you you extensively combed through the script a lot of times because there's so many cultural references and references to what she's drawn to aesthetically in the world. Um, and from there created a mood board of ideas. Um, and I was interested in the aspect that you, you did research female composers and conductors, but that actually because the character exists in such a masculine space that that ended up being where you were much more drawn to for a lot of the visual aesthetics that you wanted to bring into, which which is reflected in the silhouettes and the cuts and the specificity of the, of the costumes that she's wearing. So I was just interested in, in how that research space really led you to the more masculine aspect of her and some of the very specific choices that you ended up making off the back of that. Well, I think there's um, a lot of, of um, the starting point. There's always a lot of intuition involved um that you 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 make a mood board and um you have a lot of choices and just like out of the intuition that you get through the script reading and through the um it was just something natural that we were more driven to to the style of of the male conductor world and also to the very classic world, um, how they dressed. And, and I think that there's a lot of beauty in um, a classic old fashion suit, like the makes, how it's made and, and what you can learn out of, of, of a classic, um, man suit um, tailoring and I also was lucky that I found very modern versions and female versions that were based on on male suit tailoring that I thought were very appropriate for Lydia Tal and it's often like you start and then 
you find just the right um, ideas in the way where on your way trying to 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 learn more about the character, and I follow a lot my instincts. That's really wonderful. And and kind of coming back to you, Todd, as well, in terms of the way that you've shot this and filmed this and the camera choices you've made, you've been very specific in the fact that it's not about necessarily traditional coverage, but finding the specific angle in which you want to bring us into different scenes and different moments. And I know a lot of that was led by working with Kate, working with your actors and, and going through scenes with them to then figure that out. But then there's also the added element of all the visual aspects that are telling us a story behind behind the performances and the production design and in the set design um, in all the details around the edge of that. And so as you were workshopping through scenes and looking at performance wise, the, the specific angles and choices you wanted to make with the camera, how were the additional production design elements and scenes also influencing those choices for you? Well, in every possible way. I mean, the thing is, is that um, other than um, the material that we shot at the very beginning, you know, um, Marco had gone down to Dresden um, when we first started talking and he'd gotten deeply involved with, uh, with, with that organization um, and, and had already talked to the architects of that vineyard hall and, and it had only been open for 18 months. Uh, it's a very fairly new hall. Um, and he went to school on that and he had uh, every possible piece of information that we could need having to do with the lighting, uh, the existing lighting in it, any possible angles that we could sneak and 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 get up into the flies or above it, um, and and what might be possible, uh, and we had to we had to aggressively and very um, in a very focused way put almost all of our emotional and artistic and physical and sweat into the first two weeks of the shoot because it we only had very very few days with this orchestra in that space um uh and so so all of that had to be figured out very meticulously i don't normally storyboard very much um but all of that we had to most of that we fi- had to figure out ahead of time so uh, there was that but in terms of the other things you know we weren't um we never shot in in the backstage areas we only shot in the house uh, we shot just outside the house, but never in the offices proper. So Marco designed all of those offices and um, and hallways and HR rooms and the whole world that, the, of the machine that feeds that house that we see. Um, and that design um, was done in the most exquisite manner and dressed in the most exquisite manner by Ernestine and her crew um, to where we had a tremendous amount of freedom because the way I like to work, especially in smaller scenes is I want to go in. Um, and though we've rehearsed ahead of time on the day, be alone with my actors for say a half an hour or an hour and, and watch the scene and work the scene and work the scene and find a single angle. And the, the sort of pleasure of being able to do that um, without getting caught and without getting yourself in trouble is having sets that have the most exquisite design and, absolute integrity and that's what we had um I, there was there you, you you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't frame a shot and and not have it be absolutely incredible um you know marco's uh background is in architecture um and and that's a real strength that that for a designer and not all designers have it so he would be meticulously make these models and we would fly around these models and um uh but it was always, you know, it's one thing to look at a model. It's another thing the first time you get to visit a set, you know, um, and, and you walk away, you know, like a child, you know, just going, oh, wow, wow, you know, because these sets were places that you felt like you you could live in, you know. They are. And, and you know, speaking of, of a lot of the locations and sets, Marco, um, there there's moments in the film where in essence you would be using a singular location but having to set it up for very different locations within the narrative of the story i think it was a an infamous cigar bar that serves for both a restaurant scene and then also you're using another space in that building to reflect one of the hotel rooms that she's staying in um and then there's also the the juxtaposition of you know are we going to film something on location like finding the apartment for her or her old staten uh, um, island home which was actually filmed on a studio location 
that's then being dressed out. Um, and so what was that journey for you in really figuring out, um, you know, it wasn't just a location, a, a sp space of working with the location team and finding the right locations, but, you know, how are we going to outfit these spaces? What feels like something that really needs to be filmed on location? How are we going to use this potential location for multiple scenes, given the constrain constricted time that we have and budget um, and just all of those details coming together for you? Well, like every film and this one in particular is always a huge puzzle, like trying to puzzle together logistics of um, time scheduling money and the visual side. So like in, in this case, we had sort of two very big givens, which was the concert hall in Dresden, were perfect for the rehearsal scenes because most of the um, musical uh, parts is just, it's like a rehearsal movie. And then uh, what did have, as Todd already mentioned, is all the behind the scene stuff, which we then had to puzzle to get through um, different locations and set builds. And um, yeah, that, that that's always a, the, the biggest challenge to to put these puzzle pieces together and as uh, Todd's main um, like in terms of um, like we've been my art department we built all the sets as a 3d model before either digital or as a um, as an actual um, sketch model that you could use for uh, walking around in um, which I find also that like every set is just as good as its layout for the scene. Like you can create a design, um, a great design that's inspired by whatever, but it still needs to be just perfect for the layout, uh, layout, lay layout perfectly for the scene that's written. And that was kind of the biggest effort um, in terms of location cutting. Um, I, I guess the biggest challenge in the end was uh, finding her studio apartment that had to be adjacent of uh, the neighbor's apartment and and also work with the staircase that she's going up and down because um, it was super important that he could continue, uh, shoot that as a continuous scene without cutting in between. So um, basically we ended up in a very well taken care of neighborhood um, very upmarket, nice buildings with um, like one of the apartments, a neighbor's apartment that plays as in our movie as a run apartment, as a um, high end art collector, like a super well fitted apartment. We basically um, only mm -hmm. used the entrance door and the window and um, did a, a set build in the walls of the apartment. And um, that, that like finding it and um, like that whole process was probably the biggest challenge in terms of um, our art and logistics. And, and I think it's worth talking about why it was such a great challenge, which was um, the idea that you would get two parallel apartments and be able to access them for real. Um, was um uh again something very easy to write on the page <laughs> you know and, and something that was in reality very difficult because it, it's very hard to get two people to want to be crazy enough to let us in um to their apartments um and the set m one of my favorite sets if not my favorite set is that set the build that marco's talking about that that um that he and and Ernestine um, and the department put together, which was, um, the, you know, the irony is Marco is saying this is a really high end modern art collector, you know, this big white clean space, and then they create they created this GDR, you know, uh, you know, um, post you know pre wall apartment with these low ceilings and and this very particular wallpaper that, that Ernestine, got, you know, got and, 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 and just every single detail in it. I mean, you could smell it, you know, um, uh, there's something so thrilling about, so to be able to walk onto that set, was just like really one of the greatest <laughs> moments I had on the film, you know. 
Lucy, and and for you, Ernestine, as well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the way in which music informed a lot of the research and a lot of the elements that you brought on screen as well, because even just a detail as small as what type of metronome does she have in her office when she's working from home down to the myriad of pianos that we have, which I, I believe was a very extensive research project of, you know, what each piano potentially needed to be working very closely with Steinway on a lot of the logistics and, and locations and having pianos shipped around. Um, and so as a visual representation throughout her different spaces and different scenes in the movie, what did a lot of the research look like as you were bringing visual representations of the music in her life? Mm -hmm. I was very lucky that that substance was actually um, part of our prop master's duty. He he was the one which anything that had um, to do with Kate, whether her conductor stick or any of the, the, note, the books, the musician and the instruments, that was all the prop master's ballet. We also had a, a Steinway Wrangler, let's call him. He was uh, only taking care of the Steinways. The Steinway, for instance, which was in uh, in this wonderful, beautiful loft, we had to lift up with a crane because there was not able to get it up there. And it was worth, I don't know, 150 grand or something? No, $250,000. $250,000. <laughs> yeah. And it was the only one they had in Europe, which was brown, because you, Todd, wanted to have a brown one, remember? Yes, yeah, so it was a brown, brown. Hamburg, Hamburg Steinway. Yeah, so it cost yeah. as much as a Ferrari. Yeah, yes, and it, which it was lifted up there by our, our Steinway Wrangler Fritz. He yeah. he was in charge of of uh, handling fifteen setups, and we had to dress yeah. constantly while somebody was tuning this piano on every set. Mm. There was this one lady who came in, Isabel. Was it Isabel or? something and so all we heard was pling pling yeah pling yeah. Plong, plong yeah we had a very extensive um, excel <laughs> sheet of uh, piano movements uh, yes at the beginning we had 33 different pianos um that had to be at different places at different times um yeah. But the, the piano you mentioned, Ernestine, like that's a very special, like that's a one-off in the world. And we were, got very lucky. It's a 1903 um, Steinway um, and concert piano. And we were super lucky to get that. And the second super lucky thing is that we found an apartment um, that we put her um, home studio in and it actually had the perfect Steinway. Also a brown um, Steinway. Also a brown Hamburg Steinway. It was yeah, a miracle. Hamburg Steinway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It was amazing. And um, yeah, that that was the only one that came with the location, and all the rest was really uh, quite a logistical challenge to yes. have all the instruments there. Uh, yeah, and, and Bina, and coming back to talking a little bit more about the costumes, you know, it's it's not just a case in in creating the overall look for Kate and for Tara as a character in the movie. It's also about really utilizing that to tell a story. And as things become more disheveled in her world, and as things start to fall apart, the the kind of like the silhouette and the wear of the clothes in themselves even changes a little bit more. There's slightly less rigidity in some of it. Um, and all the while, you also have to lot, have a lot of functionality in certain outfits, like when she's composing that has to be a costume that you know reflects the character but also that she can move in so I was interested in you know once you'd come up with those initial designs and concepts that you were talking about before how you then found the different ways in which you wanted to make adjustments and make changes um, to the way that you were dressing her and to the way that you were designing outfits that would really reflect this journey that this character is going on so for example for the conducting um, costume when she was in the rehearsal um, we realized that um, she had her own personal jeans that she was wearing once when she in one of the rehearsals um, before shooting, and that then I made her one special for for us in the right um, fabric because it gave her um, a lot of support in her core, and that is what she needed. And that helped her really like when she conducted that she had like this core strength. And so we we even made her um, a couple of these um, special jeans 
And then also for her arms, she needed a lot of movement. So we made sure that like the, the shirts and the blouses that she was wearing, that she had all this movement or we adapted them. And certainly at the beginning in her interview scene, um, her suit was very put together and very classic. And I always wanted to start with her in black and white because I thought that is so much the colors of the classic conductors. So for me, that was super important that she starts off with that. But then the same day later on, she um, goes to the Juilliards um, to give her class. And there she needed much more movement um, in, in her wardrobe. So I decided that there has to be a, a, a change. And I also thought that Lydia is clever enough that she knows somehow she dresses up for the interview and then she dresses correctly for her for her students. And so there were a lot of thoughts also about the colors and the change of the colors for the class in, in, in at the Juilliards. And then I stayed like through the first third part of the movie with this more shaped and more um, constructed and, and, and fitted shapes. And then it starts to loosen up and the, the pants, they became bigger and the colors, they didn't match any longer so well. And just in little details, um, also the what type of shoes she was wearing, um, it got just let, less put together. And... And then obviously there is the last part when everything fell apart and she had to somehow find her new life and that this completely a new style, other colors and something very basic. Because I thought always if something happens to a person, what happened to her that every year the whole life falls apart. You have to go back to be very basic somehow in yourself. And I tried to reflect that um, in her in her wardrobe. Yeah. And I mean, you did so beautifully. And 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 lastly for you, Todd, you know, in, in talking about the way that there's gradually these chinks in the armor as everything in her world starts to fall apart. I was interested in how you wanted to marry the emotional trajectory with the visual trajectory of how you were telling the story, you know, in the way that you've directed it and, and the visual aspects that you wanted us to see on screen, because it's it's so many subtle details. It's not that all of a sudden overnight, everything completely shifts and changes. It's these little kind of tiny moments. And, you know, even just as an example, when she has the neighbors come to the apartment that she keeps for herself and she assumes that they're going to give her a compliment on her music because that's the world that she exists in. And all of a sudden she's in a space where that's not what's happening they're asking when it's going to be quiet and when there will be no music and so we get to see how she responds to that and so it's all these like little adjustments and little changes that you're making scene by scene and so how did you set about creating those nuanced shifts and changes both where the visuals would really match the emotional trajectory of her I really I mean um again you know um all of that was all tracked with um all of the department heads from the art department um, to to Bina and her department to Florian's department in terms of the light, um, tiny things like things that Bina is talking about in terms of all of a sudden you let an eighth of an inch out on a, on a different kind of a trouser and it changes the way an actor moves or um, something particular behind someone when they open a door, you know, um, it's true, you know, she lives in a very hermetic world. Um, the classical music world informs many of our lives, but it exists outside of life. It is the way academia exists outside of life with their own social mores, their own traditions, their own rules, their own sort of inside baseball. So it, it, it's sort of this bubble that she's in, as you point out, and, and she's just pricking at it ever so slightly until she has to actually see 
that the uh, the rest of the world doesn't really see what she sees um, because she's completely insulated. Um, and so it's really about, you know, how do you artfully, you know, collectively as filmmakers try to pull back the insulation just bit by bit by bit without getting caught. And then all of a sudden there's this, this line of sight that you didn't have necessarily before on a character. Well, I'm I'm genuinely so astounded by the incredible work that you've all done in this film. It's so beautifully meticulous. So congratulations on everything that you've accomplished in telling this wonderful story on screen. And thank you so much for talking all about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.